uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, great pleasure to introduce Professor Sarkova, uh, who grew up and studied and graduated uh, in Kiev, in the Ukraine, during a time when the Berlin Wall was still standing and the Iron Wall was still there and we had a Cold War. So she knows a lot about what you're allowed to say and what you're not allowed to say. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you remember not to say anything that might put you in our... Um, no, I, but she, she uh, graduated in uh, 1975 uh, with a BSc in Applied Mathematics Physics. She did her PhD in Astrophysics uh, on, on solar, the solar theory. She moved to Britain in the early 90s. 1992, yeah. yeah uh, first in Glasgow, Glasgow yeah. uh, where she worked um, at Glasgow University until 1999, and then in 2013 joined Northumbria University as a professor in mathematics. Yeah. But in 2000, I was in Bradford for 13 right. years. Okay. So, so, <laughs> so her research into solar uh, magnetic fields um, was widely reported a few years ago when you gave a presentation at the Royal Astronomical Society, yeah, nice and which is when we noticed your research. And uh, interestingly, you some climate scientists weren't very happy that uh, you did research on these issues and not happy about your findings and actually <laughs> tried to tell the Royal Society not to withdraw. Yeah, withdraw basically, which is press release. Reminded you of Ukraine, I guess. Yeah, uh, but I'm tough. Who cares? No, no way. <laughs> <laughs> now, you the, the research is very interesting because that's how science should work. You research a field, you make a prediction, and then you wait and test the prediction. And that's exactly what Professor uh, Sarkova has done. She is predicting a uh, significant decrease in solar activity. Um, and with um, testable uh, empirical um, observational results. And we will have to wait and see what this solar activity or inactivity or decreased activity will do in coming years. No one knows. And uh, Professor Sarkoa has said she doesn't know what it will actually do to the terrestrial climate because no one really knows what's going to happen in the next 10, 20, 30 years. And Professor Kova, it's all over to you to Thank explain you. how you came to your findings. Thank you very much. <laughs> My great honor to speak in this very respected audience. Thank you very much for inviting me. Just to remind me that I had also press release in 1998 when we discovered sunquakes. Maybe some of you heard in May 1998, they were also in all the news. So I'm not that, you know, person <laughs> who keep hiding. We, we always find something which no one else looked because you're looking and you're doing it. So anyway, this came up, what I will be speaking today, came up unexpectedly and I will explain you why we get there. So this is plan of my talk. I will speak about motivation, sun and solar cycle, and sunspot bring you to the point sunspot and solar background field. And then I will, from principal component, I will speak about my research. So why I will be, see, which, yeah, point. So you know, you've probably seen these talks. Um, many times about sunspot. Sunspot were discovered probably first months when they invented the telescope and um, they immediately put the drawing and found these dark spots on the sun. And they put this drawing onto the paper and started investigating the sunspots. But it turned out that even 28 BC, um, 
Chinese also observe sunspots, although they didn't have exactly um, data available fully. So how sunspots look like? This is the real sun of the modern instrument, as you see, orange sun because the photosphere has average temperature about uh, 6,000 Kelvin. These are dark spots, sunspots. So in enlargement, they look like this. They have coming in pair, leading polarity, um, trailing polarity. They normally occur on this solar surface on this about two weeks until they rotate and go from the opposite side. So these are sunspots. Of course, they are very nice and very bright features. At that time, they couldn't see anything. It was only first the telescope, and they uh, took about a couple of hundred, maybe 300 years until Schwabe discovered that actually sunspot, he started counting the sunspot and discovered they appear actually in kind of cycle. So he first discovered the cycle and uh, after him, Rudolf Wolf actually realized that probably this is daily observation we can, that could be organized that we can put this solar activity of sunspot with some average sunspot number and this is how this sunspot thing started. They started using sunspot as the measure of sunspot of solar activity. And uh, Carrington, he discovered at age of 58 that when he looked at the, where sunspot occurred, they see that at the beginning of cycle, sunspot occur on the higher latitude, so-called royal zone, and then migrate towards the equator and the, towards the next minimum, all the sunspot finished near the equator and then no sunspot and new cycle starts. So Maunder eventually called this, built this diagram and, oops, check what I did. Yeah, here. Uh, Maunder built this uh, butterfly diagram and this is what is modern solar activity. So you see this is the average sunspot number, which I gathered from all the observatories around the world, averaged dramatically over all the observers and poten potential cavities. And this amount of butterfly diagrams which show how they vary so every, every single cycle. So this is the cycle 23 which finished and this been used for characterization of solar activity. Why we needed to characterize solar activity? Um, Eugene Parker came up that the, because the solar dynamo, magnetic field in the sun, so during the minimum, you have, for example, north on the north hemisphere, south on the south hemisphere. Then you have poloidal field, background magnetic field coming through the whole sun. But then the sun starts rotating during the maximum, the polarity starts changes. So very often, the polarity changes during maximum, and you might see that Sometimes a couple of years they have similar polarity during the maximum north and south and then eventually they fully change polarity. So this is dynamo in action. This is why the number of sunspots varies. So how they vary so this poloidal field, which is background magnetic field, is changed because the sun rotates differentially, so equator rotates quicker. So these magnetic field lines keep getting on the equator and start twisting and they form the sunspot. So the sunspot is toroidal magnetic field and this is this poloidal background magnetic field. And so exchanging one field to another, this how solar activity works and makes sun, producing sunspot and active region and so on. So everything perfect. Very nice. Then we started doing the observation, coronal observations in 80s and discovered that indeed not only sunspot number increases with solar activity, but also increases solar corona becomes much more active. First it is no bright points and this is corona in the soft X-ray, become very dramatically bright in soft X-ray and hard <coughs> X-ray during the maxima. So this is, um, put everything in perspective, indeed solar cycle works fine, but 
So what, what is the, the interesting point? This is 400 observation of solar cycle. This is average uh, solar activity. And we see the immediately when they build, they discovered, yes, yeah, solar cycle could be very different. You could have minimum solar activity and suddenly they put up, there was about 50 years, there was no practically solar activity. Something happened to the sun. So what would this affect? Why, why we, we should be bothered? We should be bothered because uh, Jack Eddy, he was, when he looked at the temperature variations during this period when he had mount the minimum, uh, he discovered that the temperature also decreased very dramatically. So they, from the Jack Eddy's part, they suddenly started linking the temperature of the Earth with the cycle of solar activity and the so the decrease of uh, solar activity will lead to the mm, lower terrestrial temperature. So they, they put, indeed, this is the solar activity for last um, 400 years, and this is the temperature, and it looks like that more or less like, not exactly that very dramatically draw, but smaller, definitely smaller temperature. Plus, what you can see that there are a few other mechanisms which affect solar cycle or what affect our temperature. Not only radiation which come in from the quiet sun, from the orange sun, but also which come from UV radiation, which um, Solanke and others, they discovered UV gives you very big number of uh, radiation. And then they discovered the opposite force which acting on the um, temperature, cosmic rays, which always when you have minimum solar activity, you have maximum of the cosmic rays. So this is U UV radiance, which shown, which is actually higher energy radiance, which comes very dramatically. Of course, our atmosphere mostly protects us from it, thanks. But not always, if you have ozone uh, holes, this UV radiation comes to big cities, there were the holes. So we can completely ignore it. We have to pay attention. And plus, this is what uh, will happen with the cosmic rays. It was found that during the minima solar activity, cosmic rays maximal. So something like if you have minimal solar activity, magnetic field of the sun become lower. So it allows the cosmic strangers to precipitate, to bombard solar, the Earth's atmosphere, not only Earth, all planets, because sun protects the whole solar system. So this is like more or less picture why we need to know solar activity. But do we know it? We know that it is, has magnetic field. Uh, this is sunspot, how they look like. They actually flux loop where the flux loop are embedded into the atmosphere. What become problem with this picture which I brought you, that when you start predicting the solar activity, so this magnetic field in the sunspot, which Parker predicted, that magnetic field of the sun is converted to magnetic field of these flux tubes, toroidal field, and backwards, looks very fine. So if the theory is okay, then we can predict what will be, how many sunspots will be the next solar cycle. So they couldn't predict, they tried to predict not enough, but we came to the modern era, and this is how I got into this field. I was doing European grid of solar observation again, I've done something wrong, <laughs> keep pressing. We done uh, the catalog, sorry, we we done um, European project for three years, and our task was to detect so sunspots on the surface with maximum accuracy. Whatever you can build, you you detect. So we did it. We built sunspot catalog. We built active region catalog. We built filament catalog. We put them everything together. They look very nice. So we could. This is what we do. 
these are features, active regions in here. We can overplot one feature on another. For any time, this cycle 23, these are filaments. We can overplot them. And um, we can put sunspots as well. And we can give you even enlargement. So we have everything data we could. We use the data to predict solar activity. And we still cannot get proper prediction. We couldn't get something. So these are catalogs which publish on the website. You can go. But we couldn't. All these improvements did not succeed in prediction of solar cycle. So we're doing something not what we should be doing. We're probably looking not in the right direction. We're missing something, some clues. So what we're missing, some clues. At that time, what happened in 70s, they discovered magnetograph, and they started building full disk magnetograms of the sun. And this is full disk from Wil uh, Wilson Observatory. We use Wilcox Observatory at Stanford. And this is magnetic field of the sun, not sunspot now. You take full disk magnetogram, and you build this magnetogram against latitude, northern latitude and southern latitude along the years from 75 to 2010. And what you discover? You discover that this magnetic field actually follows similar pattern with butterflies. But we also discovered that this, remember magnetic field leaking towards the pole when changing polarity? This is when it starts, when the maximum solar activity is leaking to the next polarity, okay? We look, at that time, we luckily had all the data, we had all the sunspot data, and we got this data from magnetogram from the sun for three years. So we decided compare, to compare this data. So this is the uh, magnetic field in sunspots, negative polarity, positive polarity. Obviously, this is leading polarity of sunspot. This is magnetic field of background. It is obvious that background has opposite polarity than the leading polarity. So what it says, that background actually has the upper hand, which allows sunspot appear on the surface and migrate, and, but not sunspot. So like sunspot are little kids, which follow big mummy, which is great sun, and they follow in this direction. So the period of difference of this, come back, period about uh, half solar cycle, 11 years. So we normally get solar cycle is 22 years when the polarity changes fully from north to north. So what we thought, yes, we're missing something. And instead of thinking, let's see what we're missing, like in detective story. So let's remind how people did. This is uh, the white light. Remember? You, of course, we don't remember, but we remember the history mm -hmm. that when you put white light onto the prism with equal, equal sides, tri triangular, because of different refraction coefficient, white light suddenly become actually different wavelengths. So, uh, Richard of York, we have ra rainbow, <laughs> gave, the bot uh, gave a bottle in wine, yeah? <laughs> Something like that. So it means that in front, the white light is not exactly, uh, doesn't have characteristic wavelengths, it's white light. But when you put through the prism, this light has wavelengths of UV, this light has wavelengths of red light. So we now can convert this set of different wavelengths into separate one and prescribe them wavelengths and amplitude and everything. We thought, can we do this as magnetic field? Maybe magnetic field does the same. Maybe it has number of magnetic components in it. What can we do? The only thing which can separate this magnetic field is principal component analysis. So you put the whole solar magnetic data and principal component analysis, you run eigenvalues on oscillations of the sun. It runs very nicely, it's very strict mathematical method. It is not approximate method, as you know. So we've done this, as soon as you run it, you will get 
component one, component two, component three, this is what we suspected. And I if we were right, yes, we did. We suddenly we built so-called um, spree diagram, which is eigenvalue versus variance. We sorted our eigenvectors by their variance. So how much data are responsible for this vector? And look what we discovered. We discovered that my eigenvectors of solar magnetic field came in pairs. One pair, two principal components with a total variance about 39%. It is variance, it is sigma squared. If you get square root of 39, you get about 67%. So these are, we later discovered, these are exactly magnetic waves which are responsible for the dipole magnetic waves. Waves induced by magnetic dipole on the sun. Then you have another pair, quadruple, another pair, sextuple, and so on. So at that time when we discovered, we didn't realize there will be dipole, quadruple, we just got pairs. Nobody knew that waves come in pairs. In all theories, they always produce one dynamo wave. And suddenly we got two of them. So this is what we got, 2012. We got these waves, and waves behave very peculiar. One wave starts opposite polarity from southern hemisphere, it still moves to the north. Another starts from the north and moves to the higher latitude, and at some stage, they got equal amplitude, they got into resonance, and this is where maximum solar activity starts. Then the waves somehow separate and they start moving toward the southern hemisphere. So this is given that northern hemisphere become more active, and, and this is cycle 21. Then they move to another hemisphere, the uh, southern hemisphere become active, and you see if the peaks of these waves are separated enough, you have two double maxima, which Gnevishev law, it is shown. It comes up very easily from principal components. So this is cycle 23, this is historical data which we used to discover this curve, and these are, we predicted. This we used how they behave, and then we calculated for another cycle 24, 25, 26. But when we predicted, we didn't know what is, what does it mean? So I produce magnetic field, you ask me, and what? You like it, Phil? Well, fine. So what we did, we discovered that this field, if you put this into special software called Eureka, special method using symbolic regression with Hamiltonian approach, this is the software which is free for the university. If you work for the university, everyone can repeat it. So if you put into this software these principal components, this software discovers your analytical expression for my curves, which I never do with the full magnetic field. You put full magnetic field, the software crashes. But when I put this clean, nice components, it gives me two components. And look at that. It's combination of two cosine, uh, five cosine functions, but combination of the product of five cosine functions. And look at that, that cosine of cosine. So no wonder that they try to predict solar cycle 24 with 150 attempts to predict this cycle. Only two predicted that it will be lower than cycle 23. 148 did not even be close. So because they always think that the only way you have is cosine, single cosine. No one thought there will be cosine by cosine of cosine. So this tells you, aha, uh -huh, something, we got something into it, but we still don't know what we got. So we got nice expression. So what we decided to do, we decided first check our formula. We put, this is the curve which we got in 2012. Then we put into Eureka and predict the cycle 24, which is um, the solid curve. And the dash curve is what measured, because while we were doing this, it was not 
like that. It took a while, a couple of years. Well, we, the cycle was progressed. We were at this point when we comparing, and we discovered, yeah, look, formula gives us very pretty close uh, fit. Look at that. Really, uh, we found 97% actually fit. Wow. We, we were really impressed. So what we wanted to make sense, what is going on here? Because while we were proving this to the referee, referee wanted you done it. You know, when, when you got this formula, they can't believe it. That for three cycles, you suddenly got formula. I said, look, it obviously proves that the sun is very stable oscillator. So it doesn't matter how many cycles. We try for the referee from one cycle, from a couple of cycles in different combinations, we still got the same result. So look, the sun has very stable oscillation. So what we decided to do, we decided if we have two waves, we never work with two waves, we always need to in put them interference and produce summary wave. So we produce the summary curve, a standard and look at that. So what we got, oops, as always, <laughs> we got this here. Summary curve started behaving more like um, closer to sunspot numbers. But what we discovered that my summary curve is, uh, was higher at cycle 21 than lower cycle 22. Again, lower cycle 23, it will be much lower cycle 24. And what is something happened in cycle 25 and 26? Wow. So we, we, this curve is also show the same nice correspondence to our formula. But now we, we don't have artificial intelligence data. We have formula. So we can calculate as long as we wish, as long as computer could run, we can calculate as many years we want. But we wanted to understand what it means. What? Again, the referee started asking, what does it mean? We said, oh, what does it mean? Do you like more sunspots? Yeah. OK, we, we make it for you. They like, look like sunspots. Let's put this negative magnetic field, which is real negative, to transformation uh, modulus. <coughs> Reflect it all to the top. This is what we did. Referee asked it, we did. This is our curve. And this is a very suspend number. Look how nicely they fit. Special cycle 21 and 22. We thank referee that he was very stubborn, but we turn out to be more stubborn. Even cycle 23, you see this, the observation comes to be higher than our curve, but it turned out this is because in Locarno, Sergio Scarcazzi <coughs> multiple by factor three all the sunspot numbers, so they now reduce this number which fits our curve. So what we said that our curve, actually summary curve, reflects solar activity with much less pain because I don't need to combine <coughs> with every observer and every observatory, with every whatever they have, weather condition, whatever. You can get magnetic field, we're actually using synoptic maps in every observatory and they come with the same, approximately the same uh, curves, more or less. So we said now, if we have this curve, maybe our summary curve, modulus summary curve, tell us a little bit more about solar activity on the language which people used to have about average sunspot number, say, OK, this is average system sunspot number cycle 21, 22, 23. This is cycle 24. Actually, we are the only one who predicted this maximum. No one even look at it. And look what happened in cycle 24, 25, slightly lower than 24. But cycle 26 drops by order of magnitude. So remember, these waves moved into opposite hemispheres, they stop interacting. So something going on, the activity is dropping very dramatically. This is what we found, but remember we found it because we have the formula. So OK, it's only six cycles. Why don't we now calculate this formula? So we prove actually our formula with naked eye observations in these 13, 14 centuries. 
and their <laughs> actual observation fit pretty well what, what we predicted, strangely enough. So it gives like, it's not everything perfect, I will tell you uh, errors which we had, because we use only dipole uh, magnetic, magnetic field wave produced by dipoles. But what we did, we run our calculations by 1,200 years forward, up to 3,200, and 800 years backwards. And this is what we got. This is these three cycles which we used. And this is the curve which we got from these formulas, which we got, what we suddenly discovered. Boom, 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 boom. Here we got mountain minimum. Right, it looks like we have extra grand cycle. These are smaller cycles, and this is envelope cycle, which about 350 to 400 years, and between them we have grand minima. And the grand minima in um, mountain minima was pretty long one, but the upcoming, we've seen this decreasing, so we have upcoming grand minimum upon us. It is literally within, in 2015, it was five years to wait. So whatever critics keep telling me, I said, okay, we, maybe you right, maybe I right. So it is not long to wait. The sun will decide very shortly. Just stop <laughs> dividing. This, is, this was nice. Of course, they discovered that our Dalton minimum was not shown here, should be Dalton, and we don't have Dalton minimum. I tell you, we repair this, we produce another paper. But what is nice, what is found that we have this um, like envelope type of oscillations. And this is, I, at that time, I just started teaching my students waves. And I taught exactly today this effect. When you have two waves with the close frequencies, they produce this kind of oscillations they call beating effect. You know beating effect when your piano guy comes to fit, uh, tune it, he put the forks and counts number of the beats to increase the tension. So of course on the sun we don't have anyone to tune the fork. So it has beating effect, clear beating effect. So what we now see that these two waves should be occurring into different layers and when they travel from the interior to the surface, they interf interfere and they produce this beating effect. It becomes very beautiful, like a demonstration of the waves. So what we did, what is interesting also, if you look at this, not only mountain minimum were predicted, this is the wolf minimum. And I'll give you further calculation about back was 3,000 and 5,000 years, all minima, including Homer minimo during the Roman Empire, we managed to predict. So dynamo, we got this, and so far, we didn't touch dynamo at all, no theory. Everything we did was from observations, from principal component analysis, and from this formula we produced. But we wanted to understand how this wave would be shown in dynamo. Can we reproduce this strange wave cosine of cosine and product of cosines? So we put invite Elena Popova, young um, scientist from Moscow. She just graduated with her PhD. So she was open to new suggestions because I spoke to every single um, scientist who does dynamo and they were terrified. Two waves. Huh. We don't know what to do. <laughs> or just go, we do this thing, we got funding for this one. They put the sun parallel pipette. I said, have you seen the sun parallel pipette? We always see sun, the, the sphere. No, the model parallel pipette. I said, okay, if you like modern parallel pipette, continue modern parallel pipette. We, we go to this uh, simple sun. So we use, what she used, she actually looked at the Parker model of Dynamo, used two layers with meridional circulation, V, and al normal alpha and omega eff effect. So basically, what we used, we used that standard dynamo model 
with alpha and omega effect, but we put also meridional circulation in two different layers. So there were two layers in one hemisphere and two layers in another hemisphere. Produce the model, we published 2013, at the same time with the guys who built um, HMI instrument SDO, they discovered these two layers from helioseismology. <coughs> so we came independently. We didn't know they will find. <laughs> Our paper already was published. And again, referee tried to crucify. What are you speaking? Where are these two layers? No one sees them. I said, we didn't see because we didn't have instruments. And suddenly, Zhao seen it. They seen it in uh, uh, SDO. Then they seen it in Gong, ground-based instruments. So suddenly, we become singing in unison. So Popova managed to reproduce with, with, she selected particular parameters. She reproduced this poloidal field, reproducing this being, of course it is not ideal, it doesn't show things, but it shows this, you see that it is higher amplitudes and narrower cycle. This is wider cycle, this is expanded cycle. So she managed to reproduce to find some dynamo waves which general in the phase view reproduce nicely what we observed and we managed to get even these nice um, grand minima between them because we in the paper nature scientific reports we show how the difference must be between the uh, frequencies difference very small what discovered that in these two layers the difference in the circulation, meridional circulation, only one meter per second produces you this um, beating effect. Wow. Only one meter per second. So the sun is very fine-tuned instrument. Someone tuned it very properly and it acts properly. But remember, we look at this, we had another more uh, components. And we look at the our early paper, even before we got the uh, analytical formula. This was uh, dipole, dipoles which we have. But then we look, we have two quadruples, six tuples, and other things. We thought, oh, maybe if we add at least quadruple, we can recover Dalton minimum, because it was not showing there. So this is what we did. We basically, we couldn't do Analytic, uh, we couldn't do analytical, we didn't have time to derive it from the formula, but we added it from the theory. We know how quadruple way blue look like. So we said, let's have quadruple way with a period about 100 years. And uh, we add to all our two dipole waves, which we have components. When you add them, you suddenly get very nice curve. So this is was the um, uh, wolf number which I get from my summary curve without Dalton minimum. It didn't occur here. And when we added quadruple do component, here is my Dalton minimum. And here's another 1900 millennium. So we managed to recover this uh, centennial mm, cycles as well. So if we keep adding like in white light, so we use UV, then we added blue, so we need to add another few lines, and then we get probably eventually we arrive to what they observe in magnetic field. So, so this is nice. And then when you recover, so this is my previous curve when we didn't have Dalton minimum, and this is the uh, curve corrected. Here is the Dalton minimum, and here is another one in 100 years. So. This was uh, one of the objections of those people who run with the sunspot because they resist with all their fibers. They don't like that we are using some other proxy. I said, look, this proxy has much less errors because it doesn't depend on the seeing by one of in, uh, instrument or another. Sometimes they see less sunspot, not because they're less on the sun, because the scene in this particular ground-based observatory is worse. So it was difficult, but nonetheless, done th by doing this, we now can look at the back on the 
mount the minimum. So I want to get back what I saw that during mount the minimum, the temperature dropped. So what we looked, what happened mount the minimum, Lin et al, uh, I think, no here. Lin et al, they, they did this um, restoration from biological things and they discovered the temperature dropped but only 0.1 tenth of percent. So definitely this temperature probably could not account for the full uh, temperature decrease which happened during the Mount de Minimum. This is the temperature decrease in England. So temperature decrease was about 1.3 degrees. And it was freezing, temps, snowing and everything. So in the current client model, they use only irradiance at the forcing term from the sun. What we were saying, because we now work with the magnetic field, we're saying that probably you're missing the main contributor. You're missing the magnetic field. Because magnetic field is basically is producing the shield to the whole solar system and if upcoming mount minimum, we first call it mount the minimum, but it is not mount, it is modern minimum. It come in 2020, 2053. 2020 is around there. We can see it like that. So basically this temperature will be decreasing and because magnetic field decreasing and remember the cosmic rays. If magnetic field decreasing, suddenly we will have much more cosmic rays which break the clouds and cool off the atmosphere. So if we have greenhouse, there are two ways to cool greenhouse. Stop heating, what climate people of IPCC say, or you open the window and put the heat off. And this is what sun does. By reducing the temperature, this, uh, the reducing magnetic field, sun literally allows all the cosmic strangers get to the, all the planets, break the clouds and allow all the heating come off. And as you know, I don't know if you've seen it, but there were, uh, when we had maximum heating in the Earth, there were mm, melting ice in Mars and typhoon in Jupiter. So obviously it cannot occur. We cannot do this. If, even if we heat our Earth, we can still heat even Mars, we, despite it is close to us. And definitely not Jupiter. It has to be only Sun who does it. So anyway, so we now at the point that we waiting for the grand minimum and we expect that the temperature would decrease, but how much it is decreased, we don't know yet, but there are very nice now my, our work inspired the whole cohort of scientists who started doing new simulations, including different. And this year in Portugal, they met all the climatologists from the earth. They started investigating all these effects and they sent me links to, the, to their papers. I'm not climatologist, I'm solar physicist, but I'm really impressed how they describe that, how the temperature would decrease. So anyway, we done prediction now 2000, which was, I'll come back. We done prediction with 3000 and 10,000 years. And um, what we discover that modern grand minimum upon us, and I want to speak why it is important. It's not only scientific importance for us. It is, first of all, of course, scientific event will be literally astronomy walks into each house. So you, you like it or not, but you will see it. But other is solar terrestrial events. So you can check pros and cons of solar dynamo, but these big impacts will be on the terrestrial temperature reduction magnetic field. What it says, remember we had snow in April last spring and all crops 
with potato in the north, literally, and some other crops, completely washed out. They needed to put end of April, beginning of May, new crops. And this will be repeating. So what it comes, when it comes towards the um, to 2028, will be minimum of cycle 26. It will be 2030, 2031. Around this time, we will have very severe weather. And what we need to think, not about the increase of the temperature, at that time, the temperature will be decreasing. So the governments in each country need to create the stock of food which can distribute to people. And they can have, not only to people, to animals. Because, okay, you have cold, you get into your house you warm. But if there is no food, you need to get. If they cannot feed animals, they would need to kill them. So you, one year you have a lot of animals, other you don't have them at all. So this is what need indeed intergovernment efforts for the next 30 years to support nations. It will, be, it will be not be overheating, it will be overcooling. And <laughs> so uh, terrestrial temperature in the past, what I, this is the temperature variations which come. Um, it turned out that the temperature indeed in increasing, this is Mount the minimum, temperature increasing, but not straightforward. It's increasing like oscillations. IPCC, they use this interpolation. And um, Akasofo has shown this. This is simply wrong. So this is oscillatory function. They put linear interpolation and got five, three degrees oh, increase. Oh, oh. So it is. <laughs> It is not possible. This was published 2010, uh, 2011. So after that, after we published, they reduced the published paper, paper 2016. They reduced the temperature by two degrees, but they still insist in the wall. But what we see, the temperature still increasing in here. And uh, what we looked now, we have the computer. I will come run quickly. Will the temperature indeed be increasing? And what will be happening? So this is will be a grand minimum which we need to think. And then maybe beyond our life, life of our children, will be still temperature increasing? And will be increasing because of us or because of the sun? So what we said, we have this, I said, computer. We have formula. We run it for a couple of, actually, three weeks. And we got. Very nice a curve. <laughs> this is our summary curves for 100,000 years. <laughs> so 100,000 years, you see what we discovered that apart from grand cycle, we have super grand cycle. And we couldn't understand from dynamo point of view, we can emulate the super grand cycle. So we now depart from the grand minimum. It will be there, but what will be happening with the sun? So what we look at this, we suppress the oscillations of the uh, solar, normal solar cycle and look at the oscillations of the baseline. So this is zero line, actually. It is not stable. It just oscillates like this. And oscillation of the zero line is exactly 2,100 years. And you see how nicely the cycle for 100,000 years with you imagine how many cycles we get there. So what this comes from? Not from Dynamo. Not at all. We couldn't find anything in Dynamo which could fit this. So we put this um, closest uh, oscillation, the closest 2,000 year cycle, and we found that actually its minimum was during month the minimum. And this baseline started increasing magnetic field exactly towards it will be increasing for 2,600. So it rings the bell. Why this was during Mount the minimal was minimal? It probably has to be related to solar irradiance somehow. So we used the curve by Salanki, who restored solar irradiance. We produced this curve on top of our, and we discovered, indeed, the irradiance follows our curve. So it means that the oscillations of this baseline exactly says that irradiance keep increasing 
And it looks like it will be increasing for the next 500 years independently, whether we crawl into the caves and stop producing any heating or not. And this probably will do with this irradiance. Why? Again, you got puzzled, you start digging all the literature, everything. We look at this Milankovitch cycle, we look at the what sun is the center of the solar system, all the planets, and we found the answer. It turned out that Milankovitch look at very nicely. We cannot be a weight that we're part of the solar system, we're part of celestial body. So if you put the sun, it turns out it has solar inertial motion. The sun is motion is affected by large planets. So the sun basically moves around body center, center of mass of Earth's sun system. And sun radius is 696, 10 to 5 kilometer, but this radius is about four radius of sun. So if you put, this is how sun runs. It runs, this is red, four radius. One, two, three, four. What is happening? The sun moves either closer to the perihelium of the Earth or closer to perihelium of the Earth. And what it means, I skip this one, we look at the weather. So if sun moves closer to perihelium, this is our Earth in July, it means that we have hotter summer in the northern hemisphere and hotter winter in the southern hemisphere, but we have colder winter in the northern hemisphere and colder summer in the southern hemisphere. If sun keeps moving, and it, at the moment we discovered it keeps moving because its baseline moves up to the northern uh, hemisphere, so sun keeps moving to the upper helium, the temperature will be increasing, and it was increasing. During Roman Empire, they found that they had grapes in, the, in Scotland, near, close to the Shetland Islands. It was hot, hot enough. So obviously, it is not that rare, and this occurred, if you look for 100,000 years, many times, and the Earth and, uh, system with the um, sun survived this many, many times. So this is what basically uh, what, what we discovered, and what we were saying that increase of the temperature will exist after this grand minimum. So we need to survive grand minimum, maybe not us, our children, they will go through this increase in temperature. It will be summer, nice summers in Great Britain many times. And um, as I explained, and nothing to do, I don't know if there's finishing, I need it there. So even if human do not put anything, as we all crawl to the caves, the temperature still will be increasing. This is the main thing. And this is what we try to say that planets, this oscillation of the baseline is part which is in feedback of the solar system onto the sun. So everything we see, we can avoid, we part of the bigger system. We see something which is not coming only from us, it's coming from sun, from other planet, and we have to respect them. So this is basically it. And thank you very much. Uh, my first question before I open is, uh, so you, you're actually making a clear, based on your research findings, a clear prediction um, saying that after 2020, temperatures will begin to decrease. Decrease, yeah. yeah. It will be. Um, have you found anyone else uh, among your colleagues who would... Um, be sympathetic to that kind of prediction because from oh we found yeah we now have a couple of dynamo people uh, Matsumi Dick party from Boulder is with us and uh, so they, they started warming up because basically <laughs> we don't involve 
Paralympipet of the sun. We still using the round sun, and we. Because you wear, if, if, if I may, you were much more cautious in the past with what the effect of the decrease in solar activity would be on the terrestrial climate. You were much more uh, careful in these. No, I was saying it will be decrease of the temperature as it was during the mound minimum. So. When they start striking on you, they, they, they try want to crucify you, put into the <laughs> to the wall and say, put the ruffle <laughs> and kill. You say, okay, I'm not saying you, you do anything you want with, with your temperature, but within five years, in 2015, the sun will show us who is right, either me or you. And then we will see who will be killing whom. <laughs> so <laughs> this is the thing. So you have to be diplomatic when you put something. <laughs> and uh, I always say, some colleagues don't like this, what I say, but I say, look, <laughs> when we had, um, in, during Mount the Minimal, always the change of the system. Remember, at that time, it was Ptolemyum system, that the sun rotates around the Earth, and Earth is uh, flat, and everything, and the planets rotate around the Earth as well, and they needed to invent two spheres the planets should jump from one to another. They were very, very inventive with this fear. Suddenly, yeah, yeah. Copernicus came up and said, oh no, we don't need it. We just put this sun in the center, put this ge geometric progression, put around the planets, voila, you got the system. 16 years this theory existed, and they refused to accept it. 16 years, until Kepler, calculated this theory. At that time, remember, Giordano Bruno was burned in yeah. the uh, fire, and Galileo said, no, no, mm -hmm. I don't want to see. So I tried to act as Galileo. I didn't want to be get burned. <laughs> 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 but, but basically, within the next five to 10 years, we surely will see where the temperature trend Absolutely. goes. And of course, the IPCC makes the opposite prediction. They are claiming uh, or predicting that temperatures will increase by 0.5 <laughs> degree by mm -hmm. 2030. So there is a clear upward trend. Absolutely. In there. And you and will witness it within 10 years. Who is right? Good. Excellent. And this is Proxy data. Mm -hmm. I think shows that the pre previous five warm periods have all been warmer than the present one. Yeah. Now, mm -hmm. either that means that in terms of effect of the sun on the Earth, the Earth has changed in other ways, which reflects that. Or um, no, no, this, you have to be careful here. So what is trending, the variation of the baseline is very small. It's about plus minus 10 units. Sure. But the variation of solar cycle is plus minus few hundred units. So the variation of this solar activity, this word will happen. You see this cycle was stronger than before. This is the single cycle. This is part which come from dynamo. Something happened inside the solar interior which encourages larger cycles. So some th conditions were such that dynamo amplitude was higher. Yeah, I'm making a, a rather different point. Mm -hmm. The whole of this analysis depends on the principal component analysis and over a very short period. Mm -hmm. Now if you take 100,000 years, you're into the Milankovitch cycles. Yeah. So this is a set of cycles which don't reflect Milankovitch. They, they're only reflecting short-term variations and that you have to impose the Milankovitch cycles on top. So it could mean that if you take a, a wider set of data, you might have got another, uh, an another term in the equation, or you may have found that some of the constants were buried a little bit. And so you'd be make the other predictions. So, so either you'd predict that the Roman warm period was warm than us, all other things being Yeah, warm, they, they hit or, the right thing. Or you'd say that because of us wobbling around, the changes in orbit and so on the Earth, whether it's circular or whatever it is, at the time, that that was the reason. But it's, you, you can't have it both ways. You can't have your cake and eat it. 
So no, I can't. Did, can't. <laughs> I, I suspect, the idea is, I suspect that, that, that there are small nuances in the equation, which this is good enough. It's good enough for the prediction you've made, but I'm just wondering whether you were talking to Talbot just before. Now, he would argue that um, that the changes in, 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 the, in, the, in the dyno effect are gravitational in origin and they're to do with the alignment of the planets. Yeah, bring you and back. That, those alignments are going to change significantly over a longer time period. To this than curve to in here, that. what I put here, then you look at this three cycles. So when we did simulations and the very first one with this one in here. Yeah. We done the calculation of the parameters for each single cycle and they come nearly the same coefficients. We combine them in pairs. They came with the same numbers. Yeah. You get all three, you got the same number. What I'm saying, the Sun Dynamo is very stable oscillator. Yes. So obviously it does matter how you combine how many cycles. If you have a stable oscillator, you'll get its parameters immediately from single um, single cycle and it progresses well. What it says here that we can explain why we have these ground minima because of the beating effect of these two waves. So this is what came up unexpectedly because it came up that the frequency of these two waves were not equal but very close. And this is what you produce these beating effects which keep okay. repeating every five one, two, three, four, five, this pattern repeats every 100,000 years. Do you think that this is internal or is it caused by the externalities of the motion of the planets? No, it is. This is produced, this is internal, this is dynamo. This we reproduce by dynamo waves, so this is what. So there's a we managed to produce this what dynamo wave. So. so there's a fundamental difference here that some people feel that the perturbations <coughs> of that dynamo effect are gravitational, and you don't think that's the case? No, it is the case. The gravitation perturbate the zero line. So this zero line is not state. What I was showing that planets make it also oscillate with this um, 2,000 years. So in this particular cycle, there was, there was um, our, our first amount of minimum. So it was minimum here, and then it started increasing, increasing. It will be maximum in 500 years and will be decreasing. But it will be sl slightly, this um, zero line will come up. This in, uh, effect of planets. But this is the fact of the sun itself. This is happening on the sun. I'll leave it to tall boy. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Please. The, uh, I mean, you've identified the, the period around 2,000 years, yeah. which is commonly known as the Halstead period. Yep. Um, there's another one that was found by Paul D. Jose in 1965 called the, the Jose cycle, which is 179 years. Mm -hmm. If you take the the uh, sideband harmonic of, of the 179 year and, the, and turn that into a beat period with, with the Halstead, mm -hmm. then you get a 208 year cycle, which is strongly evidenced in the uh, temporillium data, which mm -hmm. we feel is used as a solar proxy. And that 208 year cycle is well known as the De Vries cycle. <coughs> yes. so, so we would contend that as well as the 2000 year cycle you've identified, there are other important cycles in solar activity oh, yeah, there will that be. also relate to other um, planetary Absolutely, there will be and, because and, and, the inter and, the, and the harmonic interaction resonant. Let me remind you that the orbital resonant interactions between them. This so curve was without uh, the uh, without the quadruple component. When I had quadruple component, I got this um, 
Dalton mineral. Yeah. So if you put this is 100 years, yeah. and when you put them together, this you get your 179 because right. it's not always 100. It's sometimes 90 years. Sometimes yeah. this is so this quadruple component comes out. It, it, will, it will another. It, yeah. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So we done on the beginning. We couldn't do everything. Mm -hmm. We done dipoles. And we found how we can repair the quadruple. So in the future, if I have enough life, let's collaborate. <laughs> we, collaborate we can do. Or we'll teach younger people. Let them do it. As soon yeah. as we got this idea, it's not very difficult. I mean, what, what's really exciting is that your result from the internal magnetic oscillations yeah. that you've discovered, and and our output from our planetary model are almost identical. Exactly. They're almost identical. I'm going to give you a copy of the paper later on, but it's quite amazing that, that we've come from a completely different approach yeah. and yet have a model output that's so similar to your model output mm -hmm. that it's almost saying there's some kind of linkage going on. Very here likely, here. the condition on this outer layer is affected by the planet. So yes. dynamo conditions in this outer layer, yeah. alpha and omega effect, yeah. Are induced by the planet. This is why they have this specific frequency. Yeah. Well, everything would happen in, in the bottom of the Tucker Clan is produced by solar dynamo. So this a planet, solar dynamo, they inter interact, yeah. and on the surface you have the result. So we can avoid, we live with the neighbors, we live with the neighbor's sun, neighbor the planets, we have to be very nice to them. <laughs> <laughs> yes. There's another question. Would you often mind putting the, uh, a slide showing the, those different formulations that you have arrived at? The, um, well, the cosines ones. Yes, cosines. Oh, okay. Yes. Just a sec. <coughs> yeah. Uh, now, yes, this yes. is the start of it. As mm -hmm. I understand it, therefore, from your question, when you've got this equation, what was the basis that you have used? What was the database that you have used to arrive at these things? We got principal component. We got this clear uh, data which responsible only for dipole. So this is, we got only principal component. So we got read of a, any quadruples of anything. We got just UV line, UV spectral line. As soon as you got UV spectral line, this um, software, uh, Schmidt and Lipton, they published paper in science, they developed this software, it is available freely for all the scientists. As soon as you tell the scientists, they give you, you can download and you can start working with it. Every curve you have, if you <coughs> nicely get rid of any extra components, you can extract analytical function. The guy who helped start to do this, Shepard from um, Bradford, he was doing this for medical units. And then when I gave him my uh, principal component, I said, let's try to do it. This is what we started doing and we got it. No, I'm sorry, but what I'm saying, to this system, the computer software, mm -hmm. you put certain data. Yes. Now. This data. All, all your argument is based on the accuracy. We put this data. Or, yes. If you go back to the cause, cause equation. <laughs> okay. Now, all your arguments are based on these, this particular equation. Is that yeah. correct? Yeah. Right. All the coefficients, we derive the coefficient. We have number. As soon as we publish all the results, I make this coefficient public. That's perfect. Now, to get to that, you have used certain data. Now the question I We use the same data which was uh, above here. We use this data. This data. Not certain. And in the pub in the paper Astrophysical Journal, we describe the method how you use. The very clearly described. You can you can do it yourself. I am not it's very excuse me, I'm not questioning that. All I'm okay. asking you There's is, the data. is that is there any possibility that that equation might change if you use some additional part of that data. Of course this it is changed. Uh, no, you mean if I put from different time period, you mean? 
well, whatever. I mean, I, I'm sorry, I'm completely uh, alien to the subject, so therefore mm -hmm. I'm just looking from the logical point of view. That is your start of your um, result, which I hope it is absolutely correct, incidentally. Don't, don't take me wrong. Now, all I'm asking is, is there anything that will change those that particular equation if you use original data that you have? It did change if you add quadruple components. And this we're trying to add to feed my uh, curve for solar activity to feed better what you observe. But we didn't have doubt on minima with the simple dipole uh, components. So we needed to add quadruple. And like in white light, so we use UV, we use blue line. So we now do need to add green, then yellow, and then red. So we don't have time to do it because I do teaching, administrative. Mm -hmm. I do a lot of, we publish with my PhD student another paper in Nature, completely not related to this, but related to solar flares. So doing a lot of other things. Life doesn't stop because you discovered this one. Mm -hmm. Everything you do this um, as an extracurriculum activity, I don't get funding for it. Yeah. It's just, just driven by curiosity. Well, all people who collaborate with me also driven by curiosity. They're not funded, but simply we discovered we found something which makes it easier. So if I give this coefficient, now we're working with Austria, I give them the whole array for 2000, and they have all <coughs> observations in Transylvania, Germany, Austria, in German, which never been translated. So we'll feel the solar activity data from the Earth up to two zero before Christ. So, and they compare with ours. So we now walk and people are encouraged to do it because before, whatever they produce, the time Solanke produced, so the restoration of um, irradiance are very peculiar. They, they, they have this stochastic, and they say, sun is stochastic. What we discovered, we see stochastic appearance, but this is visible appearance because the waves interfere and create this beating effect. But sun is very stable, as I said. Of course, when they have more data, magnetic field they measure now every cycle. So we can add cycle 24 and see if we can correct these coefficients. But from what we found, the sun such a stable oscillator that even from a single cycle, you discover the coefficients which have uh, about but difference only in second uh, digit after the comma. So definitely it is pretty stable oscillator, which is a very good thing for us because if sun was stochastic, <laughs> as they claim, it means like, like a tachycardia in the heart, human being. The person is living last years before heart stops or sun stops. What we are saying, oh no, the sun is in perfect health. Simply these waves run and they interfere and visible thing is look like a stochastic. But sun is absolutely stable oscillator. It will survive another five billion years as we expected if we manage to survive. I was nitpicking. But the fact hold, on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Um, I, I first like to say I think it's remarkable research you've been doing. Yeah. Um, uh, my, my question is this, that if one were to include the increasing carbon emissions into them, would one, um, into a model, would, would one add the IPCC model to your model over the long term? IPCC model is model of the Earth's atmosphere temperature variation affected by exchange of the water. And they never measured actually carbon, they measured evaporation of the water. And there is a research by Murray Salby, you know, he, he, he yeah. claims that they cannot measure what they claim. And I don't want, I don't want to go into the IPCC now. So in See my model, we don't have yeah. terrestrial data. So what I'm relying, what they observed before, so it's like a speculation because we don't we don't simulate the terrestrial model. But you, you have to understand that the Monda minimum happened during a time when there were far less CO2 in the atmosphere than today. Yeah. So we had, you're comparing two different states of the atmosphere 
and people would argue that the fact that we have pumped quite a lot of CO2 in the atmosphere actually changes our current situation to the climate. Uh, and we have answer within the year. We, we got answer actually a couple of days ago. Snow started falling in October. <laughs> well, which we so, we uh, Yeah, and will be snowing <laughs> uh, much easier. So I can't say what I don't do, but I can provide you the link for this conference about temperature variation in Portugal, which happened um, early this uh, autumn. And the people dedicated the invented new method deriving temperature and the proving the temperature will not be that increasing even if there is no ground minimum. They will not be increasing, they measure many, like I got um, from uh, media <coughs> center of Finland, they sent me the records. Their measurements show that their temperature is decreasing on the north. Also the measurements of uh, Greece, the guys who do in plants, what they discovered last two years, the whole beginning of vegetation in the spring in plants becomes one month later. So the vegetables, the trees, they feel the reduction of magnetic field and they go into the conservation mode. So the nature is much better responding to what sun does than people, because people are attached to their own theory, to their own narrow view, yeah. and they don't want to hear anything around. <laughs> I like my theory, and I'm going to get my Nobel Prize with it. <laughs> <laughs> this is the hope. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to go back to my question, but just to try and clarify it, your model doesn't take into account increasing CO2 emissions. No, no. no. I so do everything on the sun. Indeed, it's wonderful. What impact will CO2 emissions have on, on your model? None. <laughs> <laughs> I can answer none. How, how, Sun how, is so how, far how, away. Yeah, yeah. How, <laughs> Earth how, cannot affect No, it. the question I think that means the gentleman is asking is, do you think that the CO2 emissions have any effect on the warming on trend? On the terrestrial. On the terrestrial warming trend we've seen uh, over recent decades. Or My is personal this opinion, I trust Murray Selby. I believe no. They cannot measure it. They cannot measure it because it is too small. It's only 3%, while the natural carbon CO2 is much higher. Well, that's a slightly different question. You're, yeah. you know, that's your answering the question about whether it's human emissions that have caused the increase in, in the so atmospheric. I don't believe it, but this is my opinion. Again, it is like a religion, right, at the moment, because they, ne they never give you the instrument. I read it that the people who invented measuring CO2, which you cannot measure, they um, patented the instrument and do not give anyone who can use this instrument by other. The science is replicable. If it is correct science, I can do this, you can do this, you can do I give you all the results. I explain you how you, you can repeat this data. You can repeat the same, um, the same coefficients and everything. <coughs> repeatable. If they do not allow to repeat, there is something dodgy about it. And so this is why I believe what Salvi and these people in um, Portugal say, that it cannot be happening because you cannot detect this small quantity. But I'm not specialist in the temperature. What I discovered with my own interest that I thought they, they immediately go and measure carbon CO2. But it turned out you can't measure it because it's heated into the evaporation. All these power stations, they never put CO2. CO2 hidden in those clouds of water coming. <laughs> so you need to extract somehow from there. How they do, he explains. But after you discover this one, that all the cycle CO2 is related to all the exchange of water from the, all the surface to the sky and backwards. This makes things very complicated. This is one thing. But I am speaking what happened on the sun, and I am speaking why solar irradiance will increase for the next 500 years without CO2 because of fluctuation of this baseline. Because sun becomes closer to the northern hemisphere, it moves closer to upohelium for the next 500 years. So it does matter 
if it is humans, no humans, our temperature in the northern hemisphere in the summer will be increasing, in the winter will be decreasing, we will be having cold the winter because sun moves further from perihelion. So this is will be happening. And then after next thousand years, vice versa, the, uh, this will be happening to the southern hemisphere. So this is what this is what I can say from the sun point of view. So whatever adds to what the what sun produces is come from the climatologist, which I cannot argue because I don't do this research. But what I am saying that even from the sun point of view, we discover that solar system affect the sun and sun moving either closer to Earth's northern hemisphere or further down. And it's a fact, and obviously we had this many thousand years on the Earth, as I said, mentioned <coughs> Roman Empire, if you put backwards records, we had hits everywhere. So if you put records back, you discover we have them. Now we understand why we had them. Um, Keep it, please, as a question. We don't want any <laughs> statements. <laughs> um, <laughs> we're not at a party political conference, so <laughs> please. Not a political conference. Uh, no, uh, please, no, a, a question. Here's Corbyn Weather Action Long Range Forecasters. Mm -hmm. uh, Professor Zaka, what you've done is brilliant. And I'll just say Thank that you. everybody knows that here. Um, and uh, as regards to CO2 question, we're going to have a meeting on the 20th of December in the Royal Institution mm -hmm. where we've challenged the warmest to give us one scientific paper of evidence showing that CO2 real measurements mm -hmm. actually drive temperature real measurements and see what they come up with. Right, now questions on this, uh, you're, you're saying the sun's a stable oscillator, okay well the question is how stable? See the point I would think that and I agree with many of the points that Torbjörg says, question is is the sun as stable an oscillator as the solar system <coughs> is stable? In other words, if the solar system changed a bit, would the sun change a bit too? Now, I, I think it would. No, no we it, don't want your answer. No, I know. I'm not going to go into it. It should would. That, that's yeah, the, we discovered that that's the Saturn, question. Neptune okay. and Jupiter Let, can affect you, the can sun. Can Professor Sarkozy yeah. yeah. answer your question? Yeah, yeah. Right, but there's a supplemental well, question. Well. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a question. Would you agree with everyone involved in this has to be careful, as you say, to avoid assuming that they have the answer? Because there are, I, I believe, many factors. You see, you correctly point out the oscillation in the baseline, which I think is brilliant, but you see, that is not that is an external thing driven by planets. It yeah. will seem. Um, and you haven't got anything in your 100,000 years data which shows the ice ages. So the ice ages are driven by something else as well which is obliquity and precession. Probably. Yes, but we which didn't modulate, get planetary would you, into no, it. Which, would you agree, those things modulate the receptiveness of the Earth to oh, yeah. magnetic okay. We've the got, got uh, uh, Piers, two questions I have. Well, I'm sure you have. Melanca recycles on Google, precession, and the Jupiter and Saturn and the Earth inspired us to look. So if we couldn't find anything which can be on the sun responsible for this 2100 year cycle. We couldn't find. No. Dynamo doesn't work. So you say, right, maybe I'm looking the wrong direction. So this is how we started looking. And it was um, Shirley and uh, Fair... Yeah, Fairbridge. Fairbridge. Yeah. Then 65, they first pointed out this and then Sharvatova, she came up, but only they didn't accept people because they thought the whole solar activity done by the planets, and of course people thought, oh, this is crap, like, so, solar activity cannot be done by the planets. What we were saying, of course not, it is not done by the planet, it affects probably only the upper layer, but it still affects the sun moves around the planet, so we put everything in perspective. We left what sun does, it is sun does. Solar dynamo stays there, stable, <coughs> solid as a rock. But we still put some effect, which come from planets, from other planets, from Earth, 
from everything. So this is links us. So the theory, when they stop pretending that planets induce dynamo in the sun, dynamo people say, look, you're crazy, you go to madhouse, it cannot be. Because the really, uh, the electromotive force, we transform one poloidal field into toroidal and back toroidal to poloidal, it's very stable. They observe it in many other uh, stars. So it, it, it is there, and no one can see that it done by planets. In some stars, they have dynamo, they don't have planetary system at all. So it, it does exist. This is why what we put now, we say you both right. You write <coughs> the dynamo works, and you write the planet work, but they only affect this mm. baseline, and this is why we oh. have variations. Uh, can, yes. can no, 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 no. Well, it's, it's, uh, <coughs> short, short. It's very short. Very short. Look, if you short. could analyze it, tell us what the omega values you get are, and can we relate those omega values to orbits of the planet? Um, you need to look at them. Mm -hmm. we, we, we didn't have this time. Again, you <laughs> to tell you what I did well, today, I had lectures, I I had lectures yeah. from 10 to 12. My students, I yeah. taught them waves. Mm -hmm. Then I took train, traveled for three hours, got to a hotel, drum, get taxi mm -hmm. to get here to there. <laughs> so this is my yeah. normal day. I do students, I do things only between the semesters I have little time to do. I have PhD student who need to finish his thesis. So yes, we could do this. But if the day would be not we 24 hours, I, I would put Earth on the longer orbit. The day would be uh, <laughs> 48 hours. Then we can do this. We'll take two more questions. Um, brilliant, brilliant work. Absolutely stunning. So good that I stood here the whole time because it came late. Um, presumably, we should be able to gather some kind of data off planet, in other words, on the other planets. There should be, as you mentioned in passing, there should be some way of deducing or measuring increasing and decreasing temperature on the other bodies, Correct. which wraps the whole thing because you can stop talking They about are available. Yeah. I didn't know about the IPCC in 2007. My partner is a local councillor. They asked me to give about climate change. And I did. I discovered the Mars ice melting and Jupiter, because the temperature increased, they have typhoons which never had. So I said, look, we cannot do this. At that time, it was Kyoto Agreement, not Paris. And I said, look, we cannot do this. Uh, Earth cannot impose this on Mars and Jupiter. So they do. They have much more data. But they do not listen. People from IPCC, they do not listen to arguments. They look on the it's a this way. Last question. So I'm going to risk bowling out the political question, which uh, concerns one of the bullet items you had on one of your slides. It was a bit scary to me because you were advocating intergovernmental cooperation <laughs> to um, <laughs> mitigate the adverse effects of the agricultural failures, which you say are quite likely. Now, we've already had one intergovernmental um, effort uh, designed to save the world from climatological catastrophe. In view of that experience, do you really have any confidence <laughs> that that uh, is a good one? I don't have confidence at all. <laughs> what I'm saying, it would be nice if they put this um, from non-existent effect with a tiny, tiny amount, they put the whole world around with El Gore, oh God, melting ice and everything. Yeah, this would. Why he didn't uh, claim that they melted on Mars and everything? So they did it. But this real thing, which will be happening, it will be happening with us. It will be happening like it was in March and April. You couldn't go, I couldn't do stuff in my garden until after Easter, because it was wet. You can't walk, you can't move the grass. But if you put the crops, you put potato, they're not growing. They had snow now in Spain, they put something. Everything they put is actually frozen out because they had snow and it will be more snow. So they will realize in a couple of years or closer to the next minimum, they realize they have to do something. When there were snows in the March in the northern of America, the first minus 20 
I never had. There was flaws here that our M62 was closed. You can't get to Manchester Airport because it's full of the cars were standing 24 hours because they could move. They standing there. So if we we'll keep repeating this one, cars we can move, houses we can hit, we can if not gas, we can go to the forest, we put this metal heaters, Ruzhuika, we call them in Ukraine, and start putting, you know, uh, wood in there and heat your houses. So you can do some heating, but you can't produce the food unless you have green houses or you have storages. And it will be really essential at some stage. And this is what I'm saying. Of course, I don't believe they will be listening until it becomes freezing in June. When in June started snowing, they said, oh my god, this year we had June. What we do? We need to prepare for the next year. They start listening. What will be happening next year? We say, oh, next year it will be even snowing in July. Sorry. I can't have you something easier. So this is what they need to think. Um, yeah, global warming because minus 20. It is interesting, isn't it? The people don't have logics. They can blame anything on global warming. Professor Sako, many, many thanks. Let me finish uh, our event tonight with two remarks. The first is we will soon find out how good or how poor your research is because Absolutely. you are putting it you're not saying what was going to happen in 2100 or 2200. You're essentially saying we are facing a solar uh, minima. This will have a direct effect on global temperatures and they will within decrease. A within a decade, will start decreasing. So that is fantastic because this is testable. We observations will show how good your theory is. And, and that's how science, that. and it doesn't actually matter. I mean, apart from the more uh, catastrophistic predictions, it doesn't actually matter in science whether you're right or wrong. In science, it's all about doing your research, making a prediction, testing it. And if you fail, you will learn something. You will learn Absolutely. that something is perhaps not in right in my model. The, unfortunately, we don't have that culture anymore, which is why people like you find it difficult to even present your research. Yeah. Yeah. And <laughs> that's what we are about. We don't take a view whether your theory is right or wrong. We want to hear the whole spectrum Absolutely, of research yeah. so that people can assess. I mean, we have to be aware that quite a number of Russian and Ukrainian astrophysicists in the past have made predictions about temperatures decreasing and mm -hmm. it, it didn't materialize and they are, mm -hmm. you know, look with, with egg, on, uh, egg on their face because they made these predictions and they haven't come true. I personally think it doesn't matter whether your prediction is right or wrong, because you're doing research and your focus is on understanding the sun, and there are so many things we still don't understand. And I hope and I'm sure your research will improve our understanding of the sun and its impact on terrestrial climate. So thank you very much. You're welcome.